الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري ولو وحل المقدس من لساني يفقه قولي والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين respected brothers and sisters we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he is most worthy and deserving of being praised. We ask Allah Almighty to forgive us of our sins, our shortcomings, our weaknesses. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us guided, to prevent us from being, from being misguided and from misguiding others. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless his noble prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam to bless his noble companions, his family, and the righteous everywhere. I struggled a little bit uh, to think of an appropriate topic uh, for today's khutbah, not because there's anything unique about today, uh, but rather where I was in terms of my own reflections. Uh, because my sort of two leading principles with regards to coming up with a topic for the khutbah is generally where am I with regards to my own sort of headspace, my own reflections, and at the same time, you know, to come up with something that is topical, that is relevant. Because I think that one of the uh, real challenges that we have as a community is conversations that occur in our community, let's say they start here at the Mimbar, that are relevant, right? Oftentimes we complain, at least in hushed tones, probably not on a communal level yet, about the khutbah topic of today and what we heard and how it wasn't relevant and it didn't really, wasn't very engaging. And so that obviously presents a challenge for me at times because Oftentimes where I am with regards to my own reflections isn't necessarily topical. And so that is the challenge that I found myself today. Uh, and I usually don't begin my khutbahs this sort of autobiographical, so please excuse my indulgence, but I'm just trying to keep it, keep it real, right, as it were, especially when I'm talking to an audience that is largely younger than me, which is always refreshing. Um, but you know, and so I just try to be vulnerable and real at the same time. And so what I hope to do is to be honest and true to myself in presenting where I am with regards to my own sort of personal headspace and reflections. And at the same time, what I hope is something topical at the same time. And so I want to begin by referencing a dream, a dream that is attributed to Imam Malik, radiallahu anhu one of the great legal scholars, jurists of our, of our tradition. And it is said that Imam Malik had a dream, and in his dream, he sees a figure who he identifies as Malik al Mot, the angel of death. And he asks the angel of death in his dream, as imagine any one of us would, whether we're conscious or unconscious, whether we're in our dream, or in reality, if you were to be confronted by the angel of death, what would you most likely ask the angel of death? Is it my time, right? How long do I have to live? And so Imam Malik asks that exact question. How long do I have to live? And the angel of death, Malik al Maut, only responds by beckoning him with this gesture of five. What does that mean? Is that five months, five minutes, five hours, five years? What does that mean? How long do I have to live? And again, the only response that he is able to elicit and able to, the only response he gets from Malik al Maut is that gesture. And so he wakes up and he's confused and he's concerned. And so he goes to a scholar, a renowned scholar, an interpreter of dreams. And he asks Ali bin Ra'i, and he asks, what does this mean? What does this dream mean? And he says, Ya Malik, Ya, Ibn Mal ya, ya, ya Imam Malik, what you ask is one of the five areas 
of knowledge, of information that is known only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah indahu ilmu sa'ah wa yunazzilu ghayf wa la ya'lamu ma fi al-arham wa ma tadri nafsum ma da taqsibu ghada wa ma tadri nafsum bi ayyi ardin tamut. That to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the knowledge of these five things. When the day of judgment will begin, when the moment of the end will, will be, when the rains descend down, when the rains fall, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, what, that which is contained in the wombs of the mother, right? That which is contained in the, 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 the gender and, and, and uh, life expectancy and those type of things, right? Only Allah knows, right? That which is contained in the wombs of the mother. That when the hour or when rain shall descend from the heavens. That which every soul shall earn tomorrow. So one's risk and one's sustenance. Where and where, where and when that person or how much that person will earn tomorrow is only with Allah. And the place and the moment of a soul's death is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the five areas that only Allah knows. And so where I am and where I wanted to reflect on today is with regards to our own mortality. And I say that again knowing that I'm speaking to an audience that is largely people who are younger than me. But the fact of the matter, brothers and sisters, is no matter how young, and old we are, young or old we are, no matter if we're in the best shape of our life, the best health, clean bill of health, clean slate of health, you don't know. The reality is that life by its very existence, life by its very nature, excuse me, is a terminal condition in that every moment that passes is a moment that, will, that you'll never enjoy again. And that's not to be a sort of macabre or a sort of depressing reflection on death, and that's not what I hope to do today, but rather for us to be cognizant of the fact that our mortality is closer to us, as the Prophet ﷺ said, than the heels of our shoes, the heels of our sandal. That's how close we are day in and day out with regards to our demise, to our mortality. And it is said that the Prophet ﷺ would reflect on death, depending on different riwayah, different traditions, at minimum 70 times a day, perhaps more that he would reflect on death. And I would submit to you, brothers and sisters, that that reflection was not a reflection to be morose or depressing, right? It wasn't a bleak outlook on the, pro on the part of the Prophet ﷺ. But rather, it was a few things. First and foremost, it was acknowledging that death is a reality, right? Death is a reality, right? That every soul shall taste death. Every soul. That's an inescapable reality. Where do you think you can hide and escape death? It'll find you even in the loftiest of towers. It's inescapable. The Prophet وسلم, he once said something very, very profound, and everything the Prophet وسلم, tells us is profound. But he said, وَمَا يُدْرِكَ لَعَلَّ السَّاعَةَ تَقُونُ قَرِيبًا What will make you realize, what will make you be conscious of the fact that death is near? But before I reflect on that prophetic tradition, I want us to pause and take a moment to reflect on the sort of theological sensibilities of those around him. That is, who the Prophet ﷺ was speaking to, his community that he was addressing, their theology, their, their outlook with regards to God and the afterlife. And what we know about 7th century Arabian Hijazi theology is that it wasn't so much a denial of the belief in God. They had a belief in God. Even in spite of their paganism, they believed in a supreme being, a God, right? And so 
when we think about the theology of the time, it wasn't a denial or rejection of the fact that God exists. But one of the interesting components of that theology was with regards to their concept of an eschatology, their concept of a life after death. They believed that death was the end of existence and that was it. That was it. That was the end of your legacy. And the only way that you were forgotten is if your, for, if your uh, children and offspring and your tribe didn't venerate you and celebrate you after death. That's how you were forgotten and you were sort of, you went into oblivion. But there was no concept of a life hereafter. There was no concept of an akira where every soul is, is held accountable for their actions or where based upon how they lived their lives in the hayat dunya in the life of this world, they would be judged accordingly and according to that, they would be either afforded bliss, i.e. paradise, jannah, or Jahannam, the hellfire. That was the component of the theology that they struggled with, or they didn't, they lacked. And certainly when we see the early revelations of the Quran, right, Juz Amma, for example, the 30th chapter, the 30th part of the Quran, the 30th Juz, and you look at the sort of theological conversations that is happening in, that, in those verses, and in those surahs, they deal primarily among other things, of course, but when, with regards to this concept of theology, with regards to an afterlife. That you will be held accountable for how you live. That this life isn't just it. That there's a purpose to this existence. And the purpose of this existence is that your akhira, your life hereafter, is predicated upon it. That is to say that the life hereafter is based on how you live this life. They're directly related. That correlation. And so that was the sort of backdrop of the people that the Prophet ﷺ was engaging. And that's why he says, What will make you realize that the moment of your end is near? Now you can interpret that to say that the, well, that the day of judgment is near. But the reality is that every soul, the reality is that for us, our day of judgment begins the moment we die. Because our records are closed and we are accountable for Allah. So regardless of how many years or centuries or epochs of time exist between your moment of death and the day of judgment, regardless of all of that time, the fact of the matter is that our day of judgment, our reckoning, right, our hisab, begins the moment we breathe our last. That's the moment. So, and the Prophet said in this hadith, and, and, and we'll sort of wrap up with this, is the, what's interesting to note and reflect on is how the Prophet is phrasing this, right? Because in the Arabic language, you can say, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ or you can say, وَمَا يُدْرِكَ right? And there's a difference. And it's not as subtle as it sounds in Arabic. It's a very distinct difference. And the difference is that when you say wama yudrika, right? It usually, I'm sorry. Well, let me let me take the other. When you say wama adraka, it means that there is a possibility, perchance, you will understand something. So if the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would have said wama adraka la alla saata kariba, that what will make you realize that your that your end is near? The, the idea would have been in the construction of the Arabic language that there's a possibility that you'll get it. You may just get it. You'll figure it out. But when in Arabic you say, وَمَا يُدْرِكَ Right? It means that you'll never ever truly understand. Because the fact of the matter is, matter is today I'm reflecting on death. But when I go home and I'm with my children or when I'm planning for next week, I sort of exist in a bubble of my own self-contained and self-created immortality. A guarantee that I'll live till next week. A guarantee that I'll still be here next year to plan for my daughter's 10th birthday. Whatever. I mean, just give an example. Right? Birthday parties of Haram. You know. I'm just throwing an example. I'm sorry. So, so that's just, but that's the reality of it. That we, and even when we think about our own vernacular, 
in the way in which we converse and we talk. The reality is, regardless of even if you are a marginally practicing Muslim, right? And I don't take that, I don't use that expression lightly. The fact is, you know, your language is generally peppered with what? Insha'Allah, masha'Allah, alhamdulillah. God willing, this will happen. Praise be God, yeah, praise be to God, in the name of God, and so on. That's just the way we've constructed our vernacular, the way we speak, right? Regardless of how, quote unquote, practicing we are, or what have you. So it, our culture is sort of infused, alhamdulillah, you know, praise be to God, that that's the case, that our culture is infused with often remembering God, right? Whether we're conscious of it or not. But the reality is that the remembrance of death is not only something that are, is not part of our vernacular, it's in fact something that we shy away from. It's not regarded as good, polite dinner conversation to talk about death, right? Uh, I'll say this very short, and again, my clippers are never this autobiographical. I don't know why I'm in this space today, but if you, again, indulge me. I was probably 21 years old maybe 20. And this is back in the day, you know, you had MINA and Muslim youth of North America, which was a subset of ISNA and so on. Anyway, long story short, we're at this MINA conference, right? It was a big conference and, and uh, you know, I, I was sort of the, I was the, uh, what, what do you call it, opening act to the, to, to the headlining speaker. And at that time, the headlining speaker was someone I had never heard of. Maybe you've heard of him, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. At that time, I'm talking, again, I'm dating myself, Circa 1995, who's this young Imam? May Allah always keep him young and preserve him. Hafidullah. But at that time, certainly, young, sort of white, hit convert Imam from California who talks about the great weather out in the Bay Area. This is Dallas, by the way, circa 1995. And we were asked to, it was a minute conference going on, but at the same time, a, a family approached some of the MINA uh, organizers, and they asked us to give a speech at a graduation event. So they pulled whatever speakers they could, and somehow Sheikh Hamza got dragged into that. And I did. So at the graduation speech, this is a young man graduating high school. God bless him. Pray that he went on to beautiful things. The topic I chose was about reflecting on death. And so after I got done with my labor, conversation and talk. Sheikh Hamza gets up there and the first thing Sheikh Hamza says is he says, well now that you've lost your appetites, uh, let me kind of, and then he had his beautiful reflections. But anyway, talking about death is certainly not seen as polite dinner conversation, right? In fact, even in our Western vernacular, the way we speak, we try, there's almost these clever euphemisms people use, right? <laughs> person dies, you say that person kicked the bucket. He bought the farm, right? Uh, he's uh, uh, fertilizing daffodils. I mean, that might be not one you've heard of, but whatever. These are common euphemistic expressions people use when we talk about death, because nobody wants to talk about death. It's not pleasant. And yet we know from our tradition that the Prophet وسلم, reflected on death at minimum 70 times a day. And as I said at the very outset, brothers and sisters, that I would submit to you that that reflection of death was not a depressing, morose reflection on death, but rather the Prophet وسلم, was teaching us that by reflecting on death, we would enhance our lives. And what I mean by that is if you imagine that every moment that you lived was your last. That when you left to work this morning was the last time you would see your wife or the last time you would be with your children or that when you uh, left your parents this morning when you went off to school that that was the last time you would ever see them. Would you be worried about the fact that the coffee wasn't strong enough? Would you be complaining that it was eggs for breakfast instead of French toast? Would you argue about the fact that the laundry wasn't put away the night before? And I'm not saying these things aren't important. They are in their own ways, right? I, I like laundry being put away. But the fact is that when we reflect on death, or when we think about the fact that our daily interactions 
with our spouses, with our parents, with our children, with our brothers and sisters in our community, could truly be the very last moment you have with that person, that would enhance those, that reflection would enhance those relationships. What kind of a relationship would you have with your wife, with your children, with your parents, with your community members, if you realize or reflected for a moment that that could be the last time you ever saw that person, right? The last time you ever saw that person. And I say that also not only to be mindful of how we would interact with others, but imagine how we would interact with Allah, with God. Imagine if you knew that the prayer you're about to pray right now, in shortly, very shortly, I know people are getting restless, we're past four o'clock, I'll wrap. That could be our very last prayer. How, what would be the quality of that prayer? What would be the, 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 the reflection, the khushua, the contemplation within that prayer, right? Imagine, imagine if you knew that this weekend when you fast, this is the topical part, the fasted the 10th of Muharram, right? Fast of Muharram. And you realize that that might be the very last time you ever fast. Imagine the quality of that day and how you would spend that day, right? You would live each moment to its absolute fullest. And finally, brothers and sisters, I submit to you that the Prophet ﷺ called upon us, exemplified this reflection of death and one's mortality, not only to enhance our lives, but also to be mindful of our legacy, of what we leave behind. Because the fact of the matter is, as one of my teachers likes to say, none of us here, are get, none of us are getting out of here alive, and none of us are going to get away with anything. And what he means by that is none of us are leaving this earthly existence alive. We're all going to die. And none of us are going to get away with anything that we did in this life. That's what Yom Hisab is about. That's what the Day of Reckoning and Accountability is about. Is about mitigate, is about true justice. Is about all, right, all wrongs being righted. <laughs> That's what that day is, right? And so the fact is, brothers and sisters, our legacy, what we are leaving behind. How will you be remembered? How will you be remembered? What is the legacy that you leave behind? Right? That is a reflection of our own mortality, yes. But more importantly, but it's not a selfish or a narcissistic or self-absorbed reflection of mortality, but rather it's, what am I doing with my life? Am I doing something with my life that will truly be something that others will benefit from after I die, right? Is my life's work a sadaqa to jariya, right? Is it a sadaqa that will be, uh, that will go into for, for, for posterity, right? For our future. That's the reflection that the Prophet وسلم, is calling upon us. So I ask and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq, the ability to understand the profundity of not only this particular reflection of, his, of this beautiful tradition, but all of the various parts of our tradition. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our communities, bless our families, bless us individually and collectively, keep us in good health and well-being, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our, short our, our shortcomings. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطيع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما 
أما بعد إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطانا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما همته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا بوعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبا على دينك يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبا على دينك سبحان ربك رب العزة يا ما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وأقيم الصلاة